Okay, so we, I guess we can. I guess we should carry on. Here. So. Uh, um, so we uh, we have been looking at the uh, the drawbacks of sensual objects. Yeah, in a, a quite a bit of detail. Uh, and uh, I think I've just been looking at the suit. There's a lot of stuff still to be done. So I, I think I probably have to go a little bit faster. Uh, so we'll see what happens with the next one. Uh, but the next sutta is a, a continuation of uh, a numerical discourse is 749, uh, which we looked at uh, earlier on today. And this is the, the last of these perceptions that I want to look at in this particular sutta. So uh, this is how uh, this goes. Uh, uh, it was said, uh, the perception of non-self in what is suffering because uh, when developed and cultivated is a great fruit and benefit, uh, culminating in the deathless, having the deathless as its consummation. The reason was this said, when a bhikkhu often dwells with a mind accustomed to the perception of non-self in what is suffering, uh, his mind is devoid of eye-making, mind-making and conceit regarding this conscious body and all external objects. It has transcended discrimination and is peaceful and well liberated. So uh, uh, the perception of the non-self in what is suffering, yeah, if you keep on suffering, remember that from impermanence comes the idea of suffering because you cannot hold on to the these things of the world and from suffering the perception of non-self. So all of these three are very closely related to each other, almost uh, the same thing, different angles on the same problem. Yeah? And, uh, uh, but uh, non-self is like the highest of these uh, because it kind of, uh, uh, it is that idea of non-self that enables you ultimately to attain the highest part of this path, yeah, the arahantship and, and uh, all the full insight into the nature of reality. Yeah. So if you focus on suffering, then it becomes clear that there is nothing there worth holding on to. Yeah? Why, do you, why take something with suffering to be me? It doesn't make any sense. We want the me, if there is a me here, it's going to be happy. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to take it as I. So uh, uh, when you, and this is one of the things you find in meditation practice. This is really about meditation that uh, this is talking about now. And uh, as you meditate more and more deeply, and hopefully we'll see this later on, uh, as you deepen your meditation, things fall away. You start to become more happy. Yeah, the less things there are in your, uh, in your perception as you meditate, the more happy you feel. Yeah, things disappearing, and think, yay, things disappearing. It's wonderful and it's marvelous. Uh, and of course, because things do disappear and you feel happy about it, uh, those things that disappear, they cannot be a self because if things disappear, then by definition, they cannot be a self, especially when you... Uh, cannot access them anymore. You have no ability to even get to them when you go into really deep samadhi. Yeah, so things are gone. At the same time, uh, even though things are gone, uh, you feel more happy. And then you know that all the things that are disappearing, they are non-self. That's why you feel happy uh, when they disappear. And so you can understand the non-self nature of things uh, through understanding that they are suffering. It becomes very very obvious that it gets complicated and it may sound hard to really grasp, but it's very obvious in meditation. The deeper you go, the more clear this becomes. The few things left, all the things that have disappeared, and you feel, yay, they're all gone. And then you start to understand that emptiness is the highest happiness. Emptiness is the happiness that really makes a difference. And of course, so that is a how you develop this perception, and then when you develop it, uh, your mind is devoid of eye-making, mind-making, uh, and the conceit regarding the conscious body and all external objects. Uh, so eye-making is just the idea of, you know, I, I am this and that, I am such a kind of person, and uh, this is uh, uh, 
this is my status, this is my gender, this is my nationality, this is my family background, this is my education. All of these things is what I'm making is how we define ourselves. So, and as you uh, pursue this perception of non-self, uh, you don't do this anymore because you realize all these things that you identify with, uh, they are suffering. What's the point of identifying with it doesn't make any sense. Uh, so you stop identifying with these things. Uh, you don't think of yourself in this way anymore. Uh, and you let go of that. Uh, and more and more, you just identify with your mind, and your mind is beyond all of these categories. Uh, eventually, you go even beyond the mind itself, and all, all I make is this. Mind making is the idea of ownership in the world that we own things. Uh, you know, the more the sense of I disappears, and the sense of mine also disappears. You don't feel like the owner anymore. Uh, you understand that all the things around you that are not interesting, uh, nor are they yours. And because they're not interesting, that's exactly why they're not yours. You don't want them to be yours anymore. You just allow things to be in the world as they are. You're not interested in things that are suffering. You neither make an eye out of them, nor do you want to own them. And the conceit regarding this conscious body and all external objects uh, basically means that you have no I, you have no I am in regard to the five khandas. Five khandas are no longer interesting to you. All of this that we take to be a self, that is what we call conceit. You take the five khandas to be a self. You understand that the five khandas are empty. I'll come back to this later on to show you how you actually do this because it's not very theoretical and hard thing to do but actually it's very natural if you understand the process of meditation it's very simple to understand how you uh, uncover these things and how gradually you give up the conceit regarding all the five khandas the, the conscious body that is the five khandas uh, yeah, that's what it means uh, consciousness the body with its consciousness uh, is exactly what the five khandas are uh, so you give up all that uh, you, trans you transcend the discrimination uh, and peaceful and well uh, liberated. Um, so you, you don't make distinctions between things anymore. These things are me, this is yours, this is mine, this is yours. Uh, everything just becomes the world, the objects in the world that, that have their own trajectory, going their own way according to nature. Nature is the boss, uh, and we are only here to observe the way of nature things to take its own course. And then the Buddha says, if, if you offer well to the mind, to the perception of non-self in what is suffering, then his mind is not devoid of eye-making, mind-making and conceit regarding this conscious body and all external objects. Uh, if it does not transcend discrimination and become peaceful and well-liberated, he should understand that I have not developed the perception of oneself in what is suffering. There is no distinction between my earlier condition and my present one. I have not attained the fruit of development. Thus, he clearly comprehends this. Yeah, you are still having these things. You're just clear about your meditation. You are clear about your progress. It's just a fancy way of saying that you are clear about the progress of your uh, inside meditation practice. Uh, but if, when he often dwells with a mind accustomed to the perception of non-self in what is suffering, his mind is not devoid of eye-making, mind-making, uh, conceit regarding this conscious body and all external objects. Uh, and if it has transcended discrimination and become peaceful and well-liberated, uh, he should understand that uh, I have developed the perception of non-self in what is suffering. Uh, there is a distinction between my early condition and my present one. I have attained the truth of development. But he clearly comprehends this. When it was said, the perception of non-self in what is suffering, because when developed and cultivated is of great fruit and benefit, culminating in the deathless, having the deathless as its consummation, it is because of this that this was said. So, um, 
I found it very interesting in many ways. And, and uh, I, when we come to the last sutta, the Anapanasati Sutta, the mindfulness of breathing, and I will show you in more detail how you can understand through just ordinary meditation practice. But uh, that really comes towards the very end of this sutta. That's where it fits in naturally. And uh, I think for now, I just want to carry on and move on with the other aspects of the sutta. So we have a chance to look at all the different parts of the Majjhima Nikaya 2, all the defilements, the Sabhasava Sutta, which is the main sutta that we're looking at. Uh, I've been spending quite a lot of time on the first thing, yeah, the defilements to be given up through development. Uh, I have uh, focused on that because uh, I think that is, oh, sorry, the, 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 the defilements to be given up to me, to Dasana. Uh, I've been focused on that because it's quite interesting and it's quite profound and it's a bit different from uh, maybe how um, we often look at the suttas. Uh, so I hope you are okay with that. I hope it hasn't been too uh, difficult for you or you've been put off by these things. I hope it has been inspiring, even though it is profound. Now I want to put the first way of uh, giving up the departments behind us, and I want to focus on the last six ones. And uh, these ones are going to be quite quick, especially the five that come first. And then we will put quite a bit of effort in the last one, maybe also the second last one, because they are the most important ones. But I want to go through number two, three, four, and five, at least, uh, fairly quickly, because uh, um, they could be expanded on, uh, but I don't think they are perhaps so important for the purposes of what we're doing now. Uh, so let us come to number six. These are the defilements to be given up by restraint, you know? And what are the defilements that should be given up by restraint? Uh, take a mendicant who, reflecting properly, uh, lives restraining the faculty of the eye. For the distressing and feverish problems that might arise in someone who lives without restraint of the eye faculty do not arise when there is such restraint. Uh, yeah, so you will uh, uh, maybe recognize this. This is very similar to what is called the sense restraint formula in the sutta. It's a little bit different, uh, but similar to the idea of sense restraint. Uh, and uh, what is interesting here, you know, we, as I mentioned early on, when we talk about the idea of restraint, it sounds like we're using willpower and all of these kinds of things. Uh, but you will see that, you know, reflecting properly. You know, uh, here it is Patisanka, Yonis or Patisanka means to reflect uh, uh, properly here or wisely is Yonis. Yeah? So um, uh, restraint actually comes down to this idea of proper reflection, uh, which is very fascinating because it's almost the exact opposite of what you might expect. Uh, expect, as I said, restraint to be using willpower, but no. A specific word reflecting properly are used. So, and this gives you a clue to the idea of sense restraint, the idea that it actually refers to reflection. So, once you reflect properly, you restrain the faculty of the eye. For if you don't restrain the faculty of eye, then all this distressing and feverish defilement will arise in you. But because you restrain the faculty of eye, those feverish and distressing defilements do not arise. Yeah? This is kind of the idea here. You will notice here the interest of the distressing and feverish defilements. Vigata um, Padilaha. And um, it's kind of fascinating, a feverish. I was talking about before about craving and how craving burns the mind. And here we're talking about similar kind of things. Yeah, you're seeing things that make your mind burn because you crave with them. That is why it is called feverish, because fever is obviously hot. It's difficult to touch, just like uh, uh, the, uh, the flame that we were thinking about before, the fire that burns you inside. It is distressing and feverish. And this is also another angle on the idea of uh, craving and why it is so problematic. Yeah, yeah. 
because, precisely because it is distressing and favoring this way. This is what these defilements actually do to you. So, um, uh, because of that, because you understand that the downside of these things, you understand that these things are distressing and feverish, and, and you use all the other reflections that I've been talking about today to reflect very carefully. Uh, so when you use your eye in the world, you don't allow yourself to be to get angry when you see people, for example, doing stupid things. This is one of the most basic ways of thinking about sense restraint, but a very, very important way to think about it. And when you see in the world, especially when you see people who you have difficulties with, people you don't like, or whatever it might be, or however the case might be. You don't allow yourself to get angry anymore because you reflect wisely. You ask yourself, why am I getting angry with these people? Why am I getting irritated by these people? What is the issue? What is the problem I have with them? And then you start to look at that person in a different way. And as you do that, you're shifting your attention. Yeah? You're using Yoni So Matsitara, wise attention, to think about that person in a new way, to look at that person with fresh eyes. And suddenly you have compassion instead because you understand that they are the first person who have to deal with those problems that they actually have with them. So it's very fascinating and very powerful, and it helps us to overcome some of the silliness of the life. And also it helps us to overcome excessive desire. You understand that all of these desires that you have, they're not going to get you anywhere anyway. All of these things that we're trying to achieve, you know, more status or promotions and success in life and all of these kind of things. And you understand the limits of all of that because you know you can't take these things with you. Right? And because you reflect life, you hold back, you restrain the faculty of I. Right? So this is uh, the idea of restraint. Yeah, it is you use reflection. Uh, sure that these defilements, especially ill will and craving, don't arise in a, to a very high extent. There's always going to be some degree of desire there. There may even be, you know, occasionally you will have maybe a bit of ill will. It's just a human to have these things. But you decrease these things. You understand the problem with these things. And as you do that, you decrease and you lower it down and you become more stable as a person. You have a mind which is kind of stable in the world, and, yeah, which doesn't kind of buffet it around, going up and down these kind of ways. But instead, it has a certain stability to it. That is the beauty of the mind where you have that degree of sense restraint, which this is really about. But remember to use your wisdom when you have sense restraint. And that is the right way of dealing with it. And that wisdom is something you need to build up gradually. Wisdom is just right view, looking at the world the way. So just, just by reading the suttas, just by hearing this suttas that we're doing now, gradually you will have a natural constraint. Next time you go out into the world, the world will look slightly different to you. Why? Because you have a, a thought about this suit and so, yeah, you will not, uh, you will have a different attitude to the things of the world because you are thinking about these things in uh, a slightly different way. So, uh, this takes mindfulness, of course, to be restrained, you have to have a degree of mindfulness, you have to have a degree of clarity in, in what is going on. And on top of that mindfulness, you have to have the wisdom. You have to have the Yonis and the Sikara to guide your mind in the right direction. Yeah? So two things that are required. Mindfulness, uh, to at least some extent, so that you are aware of what is happening in your mind. And secondly, you have to have the skillful means, uh, which then drives and points the mind in the right direction. Uh, so then says exactly the same thing for the other sentence. Uh, yeah? Reflecting properly, Patisanka Yoniso, you restrain the ear, the tongue, the body, and the mind. And for the distressing and feverish defilements that might arise in someone who lives without restraint of the mind, do not arise when there is such <laughs> restraint. So that is the idea of things to be given up by restraint. Yeah. And um, so um, uh, 
Okay, so this is, um, I, I think I will leave it at that. We're going to come back to things later on. We can talk about this in a bit more detail. So let's go on to the next sutta. This is uh, Majjhima Nikaya 152. And it, this is a sutta which talks about uh, restraint in a slightly different way, the development of the faculties. Uh, and it talks about restraint again, but from a slightly different angle. So I thought I would uh, read this to you so you can kind of see the uh, alternative ways in which this is uh, presented in the sutta. So. so the Buddha talking to Ananda. Now, Ananda, how is the supreme development of the faculties? Uh, in the noble one's discipline, yeah, or the noble one's training, you might say, I think is preferable. Right? The vinya, aryasa vinya. Here, when a bhikkhu sees a four with the eye, there arises in him what is agreeable, what is disagreeable, and what is both agreeable and disagreeable. Yeah? He understands thus, there has arisen in me what is agreeable, there has arisen what is disagreeable. There has arisen what is both agreeable and disagreeable. But that is conditioned, gross, dependently arisen. This is peaceful. This is divine. That is equanimity. The agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and the both agreeable and disagreeable that arose sits in him. And equanimity is established. So, here is a very similar kind of situation. Yeah, it's a different angle, a different vantage point on the same thing. Yeah. And uh, when you see something with the eye, when you connect with the world, uh, you like it, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, agreeable, you dislike it, it is disagreeable, or it is both. Yeah, yeah it's a bit of both. Many things in the world are both nice and not nice at the same time. Yeah? Like people, we may love people, but sometimes we can also find people to be irritating perhaps yeah it's a kind of a two sides to to everything in this world there so when that happens uh, yeah you don't really you understand that this has arisen inside of you uh, but you also understand that this is dangerous you don't really want to go to these places because you know that it just gets your mind out of balance you get desirous or you get angry and upset about things uh, so because of that, you use wisdom again. And this is what comes next here. Yeah? This is, you think this is conditioned, this is gross, this is dependent. And this idea is using your wisdom faculty to understand the problem that arises from your senses being out of control. Yeah, it is gross, it says there. First of all, it says it is conditioned. Uh, and of course, because it is conditioned, what that means is that you cannot hold on to these things. Uh, yeah, so whatever agreeable that arises in your life when it is nice, it cannot be held on to. Uh, and because it cannot be held on to, ultimately it's going to fade away and it's going to disappear. And so it is problematic. Yeah. But the second one here is it is gross, which is kind of fascinating because what it means is that even if there is a degree of happiness to be had through the uh, five senses. Uh, it is a coarse kind of happiness, a gross kind of happiness. Uh, it is not refined. It is not very sublime or beautiful. Uh, the happiness that you can have through a spiritual path, through meditation practice, uh, is far superior to the happiness through the five senses. Uh, so because it is coarse, because it is gross, uh, it is not really very valuable. Uh, yeah, You want to go to something which is more valuable and give up that which is coarse. Uh, if you are, you know, have a chance to go to a really fancy restaurant where they serve really beautiful food, uh, or you can go to a McDonald's, uh, what would you choose? Uh, you would choose to go to a nice restaurant where they serve really nice food, and you would skip that burger at McDonald's, which is kind of very ordinary by, by comparison. Or I don't know, maybe you like McDonald's, so maybe that doesn't work for you, but I'm sure you can think of food which is not so nice. Yeah, think of some food that you don't like. Uh, and then compare that to the food, which is really beautiful. Huh? You will always go for the beautiful food if you have an opportunity. Huh? So in the same way, you go for that, those things in life that really are satisfying in a deep sense. You give up uh, those things that are coarse, uh, problematic, and don't really give any deep satisfaction. Huh? 
And then you also remember that it is dependently arisen. You understand that, again, that it is out of control. It arises because of causes and it disappears because of other causes. Everything in the sensory world is like that, coming and going, depending on causes. Because you can't control it, it is not really all that satisfying because at the end, it must always disappear. But there is an alternative, yeah? And the alternative is to go to that which is peaceful and sublime. That is equanimity, it says here. Equanimity is uh, superior to the senses being buffeted around, being rocked around this way and that way. Because you have that evenness of mind there yeah, where you kind of go through the world with a sense of ease and uh, uh, you, have, you don't have any big problems in life with ease, but the mind is in balance uh, and it feels good. It feels like you are in charge. You have a degree of mindfulness. Uh, you know what you are doing. You can control your life to a certain degree. It's not the senses that you are in charge, but you are in charge. You feel like you are in charge of your life uh, and you can move your mind, etc., wherever you like to move that mind. Uh, so this is the idea of equanimity here. So anyway, uh, then it says, it has a simile here, just as a man with good sight uh, opened, uh, having opened his eyes might shut them, or having shut his eyes might open them, so too concerning anything at all, the agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and the both agreeable and disagreeable that arose, they cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, an equanimity is established. Yeah, when you understand the problem of the uh, sensory world, when you understand that how exactly in the end it is and that there is something far superior, you just turn your mind in a different direction. Uh, all of this whole sutta is about yoni somane sikara, the idea of wise reflection. Yeah, and it shows you the power of reflection again. How. Um, how much you know how it actually um, it gets rid of these problems so easily when you use reflection in the right way. And it's such an important point to understand that uh, uh, you know if you want to uh, give up defilement, if you want to give up the negative things in life, uh, willpower is actually very weak. Yeah? And the reason why willpower is weak is that first of all it drains your energy. Yeah? If you lose a lot of willpower, it doesn't take long before you feel really drained because you have to use force all the time. And that is why people who have jobs that require a lot of concentration, they get drained because of that concentration. They can't really keep on exerting it. So willpower is very weak in this sense. And also willpower doesn't really overcome the problem. Yeah, you use willpower, you maybe you hold the problem down through force. But as soon as you relax, the problem very often comes back again afterwards. Not always, sometimes things change and the willpower will have succeeded. But very often the problem comes back again. With wisdom, however, if you use this kind of reflection, yeah, it is far more powerful because if you look at the object in a new way, if you understand that it is problematic, yeah, your mind turns away, it turns in a different direction, it turns to what is peaceful. Yeah? It doesn't take a lot of willpower, uh, it just takes training, it just takes an alternative way of looking, yeah? it takes that wisdom that is required on the path. Uh, and that is why it is uh, uh, so powerful and also takes less energy. Yeah? So this is why that right view is so important. Yeah? The more you have that right view, the more ability you have to use yoni uh, somanasikara, wise attention in this way and turn your mind in the right direction. Okay, so this is all about uh, sense restraint uh, and all having to do with how we look at the world, learning to look at people around us in a wise way, and also the uh, um, uh, the uh, limits of the uh, sensual pleasures in the world. Uh, so. Uh, let us move on to the next one. I said I'm going to go a little bit faster now because these next ones are uh, not as important, not as critical, uh, or not, or maybe a little bit more easy to understand. Yeah. So uh, the next one is the defilements to be given by using, and uh, this is what uh, it says. 
What are the defilements that should be given up by using it? Take a mendicant, yeah, a bhikkhu or bhikkhi, who reflecting properly makes use of robes, only for the sake of warding off cold and heat, for warding off the touch of flies, mosquitoes, wind, sun, and reptiles, for covering up the private parts. Yeah, so um, this is about, this is obviously for monastics, but I mean, you can also take this uh, to be used also in lay life as well. So it, it, it just as valid in lay life, really. So again, you can see the idea here of reflecting properly, so all of these things are done through wisdom practice, through yonisomanesikara, attending rightly to these things. And you make use of the robes. How do you make the use of robes? For getting rid of the cold and heat. Yeah. Obviously, that's what we use clothes for. We use clothes to, uh, you know, you have, you know, when you come into a cold climate, you need more clothes to feel warm. Uh, you also use it for, uh, for stopping the insects, the wind and the sun. And it says reptiles here. The reptiles really means like creepy crawlies, any kind of little insects and problems. Uh, covering up, yeah, for the sake of modesty, it's like we uh, kind of we, we present ourselves in an appropriate way. That is the purpose of robe, that is the purpose of clothes, yeah, on the Buddhist path, but it has a very clear function. It is so that we can be at ease, we can be comfortable in the world, we don't do things that are inappropriate. That is the purpose of these things. Of course, the reality is that the majority of people in the world, they use clothes in a very different way. Often we use clothes to show off. We have certain brands that are very fancy or expensive clothes bought in certain places. And clothes are often very often used as a matter of status. Yeah, the status is increased if you use the clothes in a certain way. And I remember that I was a little bit into clothes myself before I became a monk. So I can sort of relate to that to, to some extent. Um, but uh, in monastic life, or even if you are a very serious uh, lay person, practitioner, this doesn't really make all that much sense anymore. Who cares about showing off your status uh, by having expensive clothes or tailor-made clothes or whatever it is? Uh, uh, that only enhances your ego. It makes the path more difficult. Uh, instead, it is just much better just, just to be ordinary. Uh, and uh, even in monastic Last life, these things happen. Yeah, you find that sometimes uh, monks, I don't know about nuns, but certainly monks, uh, they often have robes that are really uh, kind of fancy sometimes. Yeah, expensive fabric or perhaps in some other way. Uh, and uh, if you're not a monk, you probably wouldn't even notice. Uh, but when you are a monk, you know that this is sometimes how it works, uh, even, at, even for monastics. Uh, so monastics also have their fashion. Yeah, this, this robe here is is I don't think it is very fashionable. It's a fairly, fairly ordinary robe, I hope. I, I'm, I'm not sure it was just given to me, so I hope it is fairly ordinary. Um, but uh, even monastics get into fashion sometimes, yeah? Monastics are sometimes caught by the worldly winds and, and driven by these worldly winds. Uh. But it's nice when clothes are only used for their practical purpose because it takes away some of that ego, the sense of self that uh, uh, we sometimes uh, attached to uh, the ownership of things in life. Uh, anyway, uh, let's just uh, move on. Uh, reflecting properly to make use of arms food, uh, yeah? not for fun, not for indulgence, uh, not for adornment and decoration, but only to sustain this body, to avoid harm and to support the spiritual practice. Uh, in this way, I shall put an end to old discomfort and not give rise to new discomfort. And I will live blamelessly and at ease. So again, we use food in the right way. Yeah, again, reflecting properly, uh, not for fun or indulgence. Uh, I think adornment and decoration uh, doesn't really fit there. I think that is, as uh, someone pointed out, it really belongs to the previous category, to the robes. Uh, and uh, I think there is some textual evidence to suggest that originally it was there and somehow it uh, uh, came into arms food. Uh, and so focus us on the fun and indulgence part. Uh, so we should avoid 
indulgence, but we should use it to sustain the body, to avoid harm, to support the spiritual practice, uh, to end discomfort uh, and not give rise to new discomfort. Uh, you will live blamelessly and at ease. And of course, the critical one there is that you are going to be at ease. So you eat enough, you eat the right kind of food that sustains you, uh, you do what is healthy, you do what is wise, uh, and then you can live at ease. You don't uh, uh, fast too much. Uh, if you read the suttas, the Buddha never really talks about fasting. Uh, it's one of the things that you never really find in the suttas. Uh, so you make sure that you uh, use food in, the, in a wise and a wise way. Uh, and uh, so in our monastery in Perth, we eat, to be honest with you, we eat really well. Yeah, we have uh, plenty of food at the meal time. Uh, uh, but uh, again, we don't try to indulge too much. But the evening comes, yeah, the nighttime comes, uh, and we don't kind of go beyond the precepts, for example, and eat at nighttime. We, we certainly try to keep to the monastic rules. So that is obviously an important thing. Uh, so you use food in the wise way. You don't try to kind of uh, achieve enlightenment too fast by, uh, by, by being silly in the way you deal with these things. So next one. Uh, reflecting properly, you make use of lodgings uh, only for the sake of warning off the cold heat, for warning off the touch of flies, mosquitoes, wind, sun, and creepy crawlies uh, to shelter from the harsh weather and to enjoy retreat. Yeah, so this, again, very similar kind of thing to the idea we don't really want unnecessary, unpleasant feelings. Uh, so because of that, you have a lodging which shelters you from all the problems in the world. Uh, and uh, this is what uh, monastics around the world tend to have these days, a kind of kuti or something else. And in a similar way for lay people too, yeah, you have a, a nice house, a nice place which kind of gives you that privacy and even a place where you can meditate, yeah, you can enjoy the uh, practice of the spiritual life. Uh, this is one of the great things in having a, a suitable home, a suitable house. Uh, um, and you will notice here that one of the important things of, for a shelter is to enjoy retreat yeah at the very end there it so it says enjoying retreat pati salana aramatam yeah. and uh, uh, so the reason why we have a house even as a lay person uh, one of the ways that you might you know think about having think about your house uh, is as a place where you can retreat from the world uh, a place where you can find a sense of safety from things around you and then you can actually practice your spiritual path in the house. That is one way of thinking about it. And uh, that is a marvelous way of being able to use even a, even, even if you live a lay life, uh, it's a mar marvelous way of using your requisites or you know, your house uh, in a way to promote the spiritual practice. Uh, so that is really the purpose of these things. So you can withdraw the world around you from all the business of the, of the what is happening in the world and you can kind of come back from that uh, for a monastic it will often mean having a kuti in the forest somewhere somewhere far away somewhere where you're not reminded of the business and all the sensual pleasures of the world uh, and you can withdraw first of all you withdraw physically this is the uh, uh, kaya viveka and then because you withdraw physically then it moves on to the chitta viveka where you also withdraw mentally also down the track one thing leading to another. So uh, again, lodgings should not be about statements. They should not be about you know having the best cutie in the world, or the best house in the world. Uh, that is not what it is about. Then it serves only to enhance the ego, to make you a greater person. And that down the track is really only going to lead to a blockage on the path, uh, make it more difficult to practice the spiritual life. Uh, so then we come to the last one. Reflecting properly, you make use of medicinal medicines and supplies for the sick, yeah? only for the sake of warding off the pains and illness and to promote health. Yes, so again, medicines, if you use medicines, you don't uh, uh, suffer unnecessarily. There's no point in suffering unnecessarily in this world. Uh, 
In fact, if we suffer unnecessarily, it will tend to become a hindrance on the path uh, because that suffering actually uh, distracts the mind yeah, from what is the real purpose of becoming peaceful. It's very hard to become peaceful if there's too much pain in your life. Uh, yeah? So you use medicines, you use all of these four things. You close your medicines, the food, and also the lodging. Uh, you use that to ensure that you are at ease, you are comfortable. Uh, not indulge, not too indulgent in monastic life, uh, but at the very least, you are at ease. And that is when meditation can happen. Uh, the Buddha says, for the distressing and feverish defilements that might arise in someone who lives without using these things, in other words, using them yeah, properly and using them at all because you want to avoid the problems, uh, they do not arise uh, when they are used. Uh, these are called the departments that should be given up by using them. So, there you are, the departments to be given up by uh, using. So, let's take a five minute break just to rest the mind a little bit, and uh, I'll, we'll come back and continue in, in five minutes.
Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, let us uh, continue. And uh, so those are the, the uh, defilements to be given up by using. So we use our possessions, uh, we use our requisites in this way, yeah, whether we are lay people or we are monastics. Uh, because when we use them in the in the right way, like this, support for the practice. Uh, if you use them wrongly, uh, if you use them for status, if you use them to indulge or whatever, then they become a hindrance in the practice. Uh, so right usage is actually very matters enormously. So I'll give you a, a nice example here. We have a, an example from the uh, Mahakandaka, the next sutta here. Uh, Mahakandaka uh, KD1. This is from the Vinaya Pitaka. And uh, this is actually, this is my translation because I have actually translated the entire Vinaya Pitaka. So here you, uh, here you have a little bit of that translation. And uh, this is a uh, little passage where the king Bibhisara, he gives a monastery to the Buddha yeah, and, uh, or to the Sangha. And this is what, how this goes. Uh, then King Bibisara thought, uh, where will the Buddha stay? That's neither too far from the village nor too close. Uh, that has good access roads. Uh, that's easily accessible for people. Think, uh, that has few people during the day and is quiet at night. Uh, that's free from chat and offers solitude. Uh, that's away from human habitation and suitable for seclusion. Uh, and it occurred to him, my bamboo grove park has all these qualities. Let me give the park to the Sangha of monks headed by the Buddha. The king then took hold of a golden ceremonial vessel and dedicated the park to the Buddha, saying, I give this park, the bamboo grove, to the Sangha of monks headed by the Buddha. The Buddha accepted the park. So this uh, gives you a short, a very simple idea of what is a suitable requisite, yeah? What is a suitable monastery, if you like, and you have it right there. Uh, it, it should neither be too far away from the village nor too close, yeah? The idea is that uh, it should be far enough away where it is, uh, uh, it is not, you don't get encumbered by what's happening in the village. Uh, but it should not be so far away. You cannot go for arms food. That should be convenient. Uh, it should have good access roads so people can come and visit you in the monastery. If people want to seek advice and they want to talk to a monk, it's easy for people to come. Yeah? It should have few people during the day and be quiet at night. So only the people who visit deliberately should ideally come and not any other people there. Yeah, free from chapter and offering solitude, away from human habitation and suitable for seclusion. You get the idea of what a good monastery is like. Yeah, this is kind of a, the way the suttas almost describe, if you like, the ideal monastery. Yeah. And uh, then the king, very beautifully, he gives that park, that uh, park that he has, he gives it to the Buddha. And you will see here, when he dedicates the park, yeah, he takes a ceremonial vessel. And this is the, uh, you know, if you know that these days we do the water pouring ceremony, uh, and that is that water pouring ceremony you have right there, going all the way back to the time of the Buddha. This is an ancient tradition that um, has existed in Buddhism almost from the very beginning. It's kind of fascinating. Yeah. Anyway, I thought that was kind of nice. Uh, now I'm going to move on to the <coughs> uh, next sutta, and this sutta is called the uh, Sevitabha, uh, Sevitabha Sutta, to be used and not to be used. And the idea here is to give us a very clear idea of how to decide what we should use in our life uh, and what we should not use. Uh, how do we make a decision what is suitable in this world? And this is what the Buddha says. Uh, Sariputta. Uh, robes are of two kinds. In other words, there are two kinds of robes, say, to be used and not to be 
So it was said by the Blessed One and with reference to what was this said. Yeah, and this idea that things are of two kinds, yeah, either to be used or not to be used, this is a general truth that relates to everything in life. Yeah, everything you own in this world, everything that you use, whether it is your house, your clothes, your car, or whatever it is, all of these things have these kind of qualities, either to be used or not to be used. And especially for monastics, of course, this is particularly important. Uh, because uh, uh, the monastic path, uh, the thing, everything is really meant specifically to enhance the practice. Uh, yeah, that's what it's all about. Uh, Venerable Sir, such roads as cause unwholesome qualities to increase uh, and wholesome qualities to diminish uh, in one who uses them should not be used. Uh, but such robes as causes unwholesome qualities to diminish and also this to increase in one who uses them, such robes should be used. So it was with reference to this that it was said by the Buddha, Sariputta, robes are of two kinds, I say, to be used and not to be used. It's such a beautiful statement, they're so simple and so clear. And the way that we can decide anything in life, yeah, anything that we use, anything that we do, where we live, the hobbies that we have, whether we, you know, what kind of Buddhist society we are part of, uh, what kind of ownership we have, the things that we use in this world. Uh, for a monastic, it's very simple. The arms we, we use, the robes we use, the kutis we have, the teacher we have, that sort of thing. It's a very simple criterion. Uh, does it help us on the path uh, or does it not help us on the path? Uh, and if it helps us on the path, uh, if it makes the good qualities become established, uh, if it reduces the negative defilements of the mind, uh, then you are on the right track. Yeah? That is really all it is to it. Yeah? So if your robes make you crave, uh, if your robes increases your sense of ego, if your robes make you angry, maybe because they are too coarse and too harsh, uh, then they are the wrong robes. Uh, but if there are the robes that are just right, just do what they're supposed to be doing, uh, and they lead you onwards on the path, they are helpful for the practice, uh, then it is the right robe. So very simple, very powerful way of thinking about everything in life. Yeah? Everything in life uh, can be measured in this way. Uh, if something is helpful to improve your life, improve the spiritual practice, uh, if you become a better person because you use something or you do something, you have someone as a teacher, or whatever it is, then you know you're on the right track. You should be using that even more. Yeah. If something, on the other hand, leads to a decline in the practice, leads to a de decline in your good qualities, it makes you less kind, it makes you more having more defilements or whatever, then it is problematic. You should not use it. Very, very powerful saying and very useful. Then the Buddha says the same thing for arms food. Yeah, we're not talking about the monastic situation, arms food also is of two kinds, to be used and not to be used. Resting places, this is the senasana, are of two kinds, yeah, to be used and not to be used. And uh, so it is with all things in life, uh, everything has these two sides to them. Uh, either they are right uh, or they are wrong. Uh, and it is up for each one of us to make sure that we use those things that are suitable so we can make progress on this path. Okay. Then we come to the uh, defilements to be given up by enduring. This is the next uh, little passage here. Uh, we are uh, still working on the uh, Sambhasava Sutta, on all the defilements. We're now coming to the fourth kind of defilements, the fourth kind of way. And to give up these defilements. So what are the defilements that should be given up by enduring? Take a mendicant who, reflecting properly, endures cold, heat, hunger, and thirst. They endure the touch of flies, mosquitoes, the wind, the sun, and the creepy crawlies. They endure rude and unwelcome speech. And they put up with physical pain, sharp Fear, acute, and life-threatening. 
Yeah, so the uh, idea here is simply that sometimes we cannot avoid things. Sometimes you are going to be a little bit cold. Sometimes you're going to be a bit hot. Yeah, if you are in Malaysia, sometimes you can avoid the heat because it is always a little bit hot, always a little bit humid. So you have to kind of just deal with that. You have to shrug your shoulders and say, well, this is what it is like here. So I'm going to have to live with that in a certain way. Sometimes you might be a bit hungry or thirsty because of what you're doing. And yeah, so whenever things are out of control, whenever we cannot control our, our environment, and sometimes you can't, then that is the time to endure, yeah, because you cannot control that. But the point here is not that we endure unnecessarily. If you don't have to endure, if it is possible to find comfort, if it is possible to be at ease, then you are at ease. We have seen that before, yeah, it's the power of using of the reflecting properly by using, you use these things uh, to overcome any uh, unpleasantness, yeah, any ill, ill at easiness that we may have. Uh, we use these things properly, and it's only really when we are uh, cannot control the environment, which will happen sometimes, uh, then you have no choice, and then you have to endure. Yeah, you have to under understand that now is the time to endure so that you do not become upset or have ill will or too much craving, but you go with the flow instead of the way things are. Then you have the idea of enduring all of these uh, um, uh, mosquitoes, wind, sun and reptiles. Yeah, these are also things that sometimes you have to endure. Then, of course, you have the rude and unwelcome speech. Yeah, you know what that is like in the world. You have people who are always with somebody who says things that are not very pleasant. It is just that sometimes people are so, people are a bit insensitive or their conditioning is such that they don't really understand that they are being rude and unwelcome in their speech. And, and some people are like that. And uh, I don't know, maybe I, I hope I'm not like that. If, if I am, please, please tell me so I, <laughs> I can find out about these things. I hope I'm not, I, I try not to be, but who knows? So what do you do? Well, sometimes you just have to endure. Yeah? If you go out into the city or in the monastery and the people come every day, there's always going to be somebody who speaks in a way that is uh, unpleasant and difficult. And you have really no choice but to endure. You cannot go correcting everyone in the world. It is impossible. Uh, sometimes you just have to say, OK, this is the nature of the world. Uh, I'm going to deal with this just by enduring it. Uh, and then I, as soon as I can, I will get out of the situation so I don't have to endure anymore. And the same thing is true for the physical pains of the body. Yeah, yeah it's very often it's very difficult. It is impossible to always have the body be right. And even if you use medicines, even if you have the best of doctor, there will be times when you have physical pains. And it is impossible to avoid that at all times. When you meditate, there will be times when you are a little bit in discomfort yeah? and you have to deal with that discomfort. You can't always change your posture, even when you have the tiniest bit of discomfort, because if you do, you will never get anything that have put up with that physical pain. That is the nature of what, the nature of this world. There will be a degree of physical pain. So you endure it. So one of the most important points here is to be able to distinguish when should we avoid things and when should we endure and that ability to distinguish between avoiding and enduring is an important one as long as far as you can avoid the unpleasantnesses of the world as far as you can you do actually avoid things there's no point in putting yourself in harm's way or putting yourself in a way whereby you are going to have suffering there's really no point to that at all so you avoid it and then when you cannot avoid, when you know that that is impossible, you don't get upset, you don't get angry, you don't crave early. And then, yeah, then what happens is that those distressing and feverish defilements that might arise in someone who lives without enduring, these things do not arise when they are endured. These are called defilements that should be given up by enduring them. Now we have this beautiful little uh, sutta on uh, uh, patience. This is from the uh, Dhammapada. This is a very famous little uh, 
verse that you have heard many times before. Yeah, patient endurance is the highest austerity. Kanti Paramatapo Tikkara. Nibbana yeah, or extinguishment is supreme, say the Buddhas. He is not a true monk, or they are not a true uh, mendicant or ascetic who harms another, nor a true renunciant who oppresses others. So uh, I, it's a very, it's a nice little verse. Yeah, patient endurance is the highest austerity. I really recommend you to read the Dhammapada sometimes because it's full of these beautiful little sayings and here you find it again. Patient endurance is the highest austerity. Yeah, what, in what sense? One of the things that you have to remember about the teachings of the Buddha is that he would use the existing vocabulary at that time. And one of the existing words at that time was this word called tapo. Tapo means austerity. And so the Buddha redefined these words. In ancient India, the idea of tapo or austerity, it would mean that you would put yourself under a lot of suffering, a lot of dukkha, standing on one leg for many years, hanging out on rocks that were superheated, like the Jains would do. So it was a kind of austerity that was very common, or you wouldn't eat at all, and you would become so thin that you, you, know, you, you almost died, and, and all of these kind of things. But the Buddha, he refines, he redefines that idea of austerity. Here. And he says patient, patient endurance is actually the highest austerity. Here. And, uh, and so patient endurance is the idea of being able to bear with things, yeah? not reacting to things, but understanding it. that in certain contexts there is no choice uh, but to allow things to be and to deal with them. Here. If you would notice here, it is not just endurance. Yeah? Endurance may mean that you are gritting your teeth and you find it really hard, but it's actually patient endurance. Patient means that you are able to deal with it without getting emotional. Yeah? That is the austerity. So a beautiful way of redefining the idea of austerity. Yeah? Yeah? And this is kind of the best way of thinking about this. And then the rest of the verse briefly nibbana yeah uh, the extinguishment is supreme say the buddhas uh, the highest thing that we're trying to do a true monastic uh, one is not a true monastic uh, if you harm another uh, monasticism uh, the buddhist path is about kindness uh, it's about caring but looking after people it's about having a sense of compassion uh, and if you haven't got that as a monastic you have a real problem. You know, this is really the essence of what uh, monasticism and Buddhism is about, non-harming. Uh, four things that are said to be the essence of the Buddhist path. Uh, one is non-harming, another one is non-desire or non-covetousness uh, non or longings of others. Uh, the third one is mindfulness uh, and the fourth one is samadhi. Is that said to be the four things that define the spiritual path? Yeah, not harming, not desiring, uh, mindfulness, and samadhi, stillness of the mind. Uh, so, if you are a monk, you should not harm another. So, uh, uh, in my experience, as certainly the monks here, they are very harmless people, which is correct. Uh, nor a true, nor is one a true renunciant uh, if you oppress other people. Uh, yeah, oppression of others, uh, again, is similar to harming. Uh, that is really the wrong way if you are a renunciant. You should be caring. You should be kind. You should look after others. Uh, that's the whole point, a very large point of the spiritual path. Uh, and if you can't do that, then it is really problematic. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next one as well. I'm going a little bit fast now. I hope you will forgive me for that. But uh, as usual, I tend to have a little bit too many suttas. Either that or the time is a bit too short. I'm not sure which one, maybe a little both. So uh, I'm going a little bit faster now. So these are uh, the defilements to be given up by avoiding. Yeah? We have seen, uh, just seen the idea of uh, defilements to be given up by um, 
and enduring, right? And, and now it is avoiding. It's like two sides of the same coin in a sense, uh, enduring and avoiding. Uh, what are the defilements that should be given up by avoiding? Uh, take a mendicant who, reflecting properly, avoids a wild elephant, a wild horse, a wild ox, a wild dog, a snake, a stump, a thorny ground, a pit, a cliff, a swamp, and a sewer. Reflecting properly, they avoid sitting on inappropriate seats, walking in an appropriate neighborhoods, and mixing with bad friends. Whatever the sensible, sensible spiritual companions would believe is a bad thing to do. Yeah, bad setting, a bad thing to do. So you avoid all of these things because they are, are negative and problematic. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. You avoid a wild elephant and a wild horse, a pit, a cesspit, and all of these kind of things. And uh, what this reminds you, it reminds you that monastics very often, they would live in the forest, yeah? they would live far away. And because they did that, you actually have to be smart in how you lived in the forest. Uh, you're not stupid, you don't put yourself in harm's way, you don't do things that are inappropriate to yourself. Uh, you find that balance again, the balance between um, um, living secluded far away, but not being uncomfortable. Uh, so that may be very obvious, but the next thing here is uh, probably a bit more interesting. Yeah, you're reflecting pro properly. You avoid sitting in inappropriate seats, walking in inappropriate neighborhoods. Yeah, and this is a, a for a monastic. Well, this would mean if you are, you know, uh, hanging out too much with uh, people who you are attracted to. Yeah, if you if you are attracted to women you don't want to hang out too much with them because it leads to even more attraction or if you are a nun and you are attracted to men maybe then you have to be careful not to hang out too much with them because it may lead to problems if you do that as a lay person yeah you you, you try if you are attracted to somebody but you are already married you don't want to hang out too much with those people you're attracted to because it will have a bad effect on your marriage if you do, they actually lead you astray. Yeah. This is like hanging out with the right people. They're not using inappropriate seats, walking in inappropriate neighborhoods. Yeah. And for a monastic, uh, inappropriate neighborhoods would really be anywhere that gives rise to defilements. Yeah, uh, hanging out in in the places that are sensual in one way uh, or another, whatever that might be. Yeah. So. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's fairly obvious the sort of things that we're talking about, but even going into a city, yeah, a city is a very sensual place, uh, uh, full of cafes, full of entertainment, a place where people go dating and all of these kind of things. Uh, so you don't really want to spend too much time in the city as a monastic. Yeah? And if you do go into the city, it is really just to do whatever business you have, whether it is collecting arms uh, or maybe going on a teaching appointment or something like that, that you stick to what the reason actually is for being there. And then comes the last one, which is very interesting. This is you should avoid mixing with bad friends. Yeah. And this is one of those very important parts of the Buddhist path. Uh, and sometimes we think that we are very strong and we think that we can mix with bad friends a little bit uh, as long as we also have good friends. Uh, uh, but remember that we tend to be very influenced by the people around us. Uh, and the more you have bad friends, people who point you in the wrong direction, uh, people who are not interested in Buddhism, uh, people who are maybe do things that are a bit immoral, uh, it's guaranteed that it will influence you. It will have an effect on you. Uh, why? Because by being around such people, by having them as friends, it will also be drawn a little bit in that direction. Uh, so the idea in Buddhism is to have as many good friends, as many spiritual friends as possible. Uh, that is why you have the Buddhist fellowship, yeah, the uh, BGF uh, Buddhist uh, and the, the, the Buddhist Gem Fellowship in uh, in KL. That's why we have Buddhist organization like the BSWA in uh, uh, Perth. Uh, that is why you have monasteries. So it gives you a place where you can hang out with the right kind of people there. Uh, people who think like you, people who encourage you to practice in the right way. 
people who say the right thing, and people who enhance your understand on the students, uh, people who help you with your wisdom, uh, people who uh, sit you down, people who you feel calm with, people who you feel relaxed with, people who help you to become a kinder person. Uh, that is the right kind of person. Uh, and in the end, the way that you know whether someone is a good person or not, or a good friend, uh, is you know if you, again, your good qualities are increasing and your bad qualities are declining. If that is happening, then you know that you are on the right track. Yeah. Spiritual friendship is so important. Yeah. And many of you will know that when I teach from the sutta, as I often quote, the very famous sutta, where the Buddha says that spiritual friendship yeah, is 100% of the spiritual life. Yeah. You know how it goes when Ananda says to the Buddha that spiritual friendship is 50% of the spiritual life. Yeah. And the Buddha says to Ananda, not so, Ananda, not so. Yeah. Spiritual friendship is 100% of the spiritual life. And it's so easy to get that wrong. It's so easy to think, oh, surely the Buddha is exaggerating for effect. Yeah? How can it be 100%? There are many, many other aspects of the spiritual life apart from spiritual friendship. But the point, of course, is that uh, uh, there is no beginning of the spiritual path without spiritual friendship. The whole path begins, like we saw the other day, uh, it begins with the voice of another person. Uh, it begins with the ability to get and to kind of move you forward. And without that, there's no starting point at all with this whole thing. Uh, so it is so important yeah, to remember that. And this means, this is why we come back to the suttas, why you come back to the Buddha, why you come back to the areas in the world, the noble ones, uh, because it is so important to, to get these things right. Uh, it is actually what the whole path possible. We need to be conditioned. We need to uh, allow ourselves to be brainwashed by the beautiful teachings. And as you are conditioned by these beautiful teachings, gradually, gradually, you grow in the right direction. And your yoniso manasikara, your wise reflection, all of that is pointing in the right way. And that is really what this is about. So please remember all of that. And then it says, whatever the sensible spiritual companions would believe is a bad setting or a bad thing. Sometimes you can ask yourself, if you have a doubt about whether something is good or bad, you can ask yourself the very simple question, what would the Buddha do in this situation? Yeah, it's a very powerful question. You have some idea of the Buddha as a very kind person, as a very compassionate and full of metta and all these things, but also, of course, as a very wise person. So ask yourself if you have doubts about whether something is the right setting or not, the right kind of friend, the right kind of place. Ask yourself what the Buddha would do, yeah? And then maybe it will give you some idea what is right. Ask yourself what Ajahn Brahm would do. Ask yourself what your favorite monk in this world, Ajahn Gandha, whoever it is, your favorite monastic or Venerable Punsiri, or whoever it is that you are, uh, who you uh, have some faith and confidence in, uh, ask what they would do in that situation. And then you have some idea of what is appropriate. Uh, and then the Buddha says that uh, for the distressing and feverish defilements that might arise in someone who lives without avoiding these things, uh, do not arise when they are avoided. Uh, these are called the defilements uh, that should be given up by avoiding him. Yeah. Okay, everyone. So uh, there you are. We are now making it. I think it will be going very well and hopefully you are enjoying this. I think now we're gonna have to have another break because uh, I think my mind is about to seize up. I can't think anymore. So <laughs> we're gonna have a small short break about half an hour or so. So see you back again at around 3.30 and we're going to have a Q&A session. Then.